I'm Jill Hartz, the executive director of the Jordan Schnitz Bart, and I am happy that you're here. So, eloquent, powerful, sad, and beautiful. I think that anyone who has spent time with Julie Green's The Last Supper would agree that these are fitting adjectives for her show. And I also think that you'd agree that they don't come close to expressing what we actually feel when we experience the unusual elegiac quality of her work. The Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art is honored to show The Last Supper, and we are <coughs> especially honored to welcome the artist Julie Green tonight to tell us more about her work. Julie was born in Japan in 1961 she has two degrees from the University of Kansas, a BFA and an MFA in, uh, MFA in painting with honors. She has served as an assistant to master printer Michael Sims at the Lawrence Lithography Workshop in Kansas. And she has taught at a number of universities and is currently an associate professor at OSU. Julie, Julie's work has been included in numerous solo and group exhibitions in the United States and abroad. And I should say the Last Supper represents just one aspect of her work, and you may mention that too. Julie is the recipient of a prestigious Joan Mitchell Painter and Sculptor Award, and her work has been featured most recently in the New York Times, as well as in Ceramic Monthly and Gastronomics, as well as on National Public Radio. I believe she will be a guest soon on the Colbert Report, so we'll have to stay tuned for that. That should be funny. Our exhibition of The Last Supper builds on a series of programs originating with the Eugene Opera's Northwest premiere of Dead Man Walking. And I think before Julie comes <coughs> up, I'd like to introduce Mark Kader, who's the, man who's the general manager, right? And the Eugene yeah. Opera, yeah. and will tell us more about the programs um, that are planned in conjunction with this. Do you want to use this? You can try. I can try, but you can yell too. I, that's my profession is to <laughs> speak in an outdoor voice all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, I thank thank you for having me, Professor Green. Thank you for for including me in this event. Um, the uh, the, there's a brochure at the back. I, I won't take your time to describe too much about what you can read about, but it has the next week and a half of really extraordinary events. There'll be uh, sponsors who are celebrating their 40th anniversary. There's a master class here on campus um, featuring uh, the composer Jay Kege. There's a conference on prisons and peace uh, that's directed by Professor Stephen Shankman here. Sister Helen will be at that conference, I think, on Thursday. Um, and then, of course, we have the opera next Friday and Sunday. Um, in, uh, it's been an extraordinary year of planning for this. Uh, it's been an extraordinary six weeks of events, um, of which this is one. Um, Roger Ebert wrote in his review of the film Dead Man Walking that it made him feel uh, ennobled to be part of a profession that could make such art. I feel that way about the opera, and I certainly feel uh, ennobled to be part of art when it can produce something as extraordinary as what you'll see this evening. So thank you for having me, and um, Professor Green, thank you so much for, for your work. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to say that in conjunction with The Last Supper, there is an amazing book. And um, a sample of that book is in our bookstore, so you're welcome to look at that after the talk today. And we know that there are limited quantities that are coming to us. So Suzanne in the bookstore is willing to take your order if you want, and they should be here perhaps tomorrow, but at least you'll be able to look at one tonight if you would like. Um, so now please join me in welcoming Julie Green. I'm not super used to a big mic. Can you hear me? Is that distance about right? 
Okay, fine, perfect. Well, remind me, actually it's on the wrong side. <laughs> Let me know because it is important that you can hear me. It works best that way. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to thank this museum and particularly uh, Jill Hartz and the crew, Kurt, Charlie, I don't want to forget anybody, Josh, so I wrote them down, Diane, um, the design works beautiful, Sharon, uh, Debbie, and Suzanne. Um, I know that I've worked very closely with Jill for maybe six months on this and um, Charlie, a uh, doing the installation, it's just beautiful. I'm, I'm so pleased to come, I've just seen the show today. How many of you have, have had a chance to see the exhibition? Um, it fit, so that was great, we weren't sure. <laughs> Having uh, had it at the Art Center in Corvallis before quite a bit larger space, um, it was hard to visualize if it would fit all 500 plates, and um, there's Charlie, right, thank you. Yeah, and, and Jill, where, where is Jill in, sitting there, right in front, right. Um, You've just been a pleasure to work with, and it's been such a busy time for me, and you've, you're, you and your staff have just been delightful and so well organized and just did a beautiful job, so thank you. And even parking, yay! <laughs> right down to parking by the museum, which is great. Um, and then I wanted to thank everybody for coming out tonight on a rainy March night, and several OSU students looking at, their, looking at themselves at Lucinda Williams' uh, uh, studio did I say Lucinda, Lucinda Parker Studios, sorry, um, a couple of weeks ago. So um, thank you for coming. And um, the comment book is part of the exhibition, and so there's two books. There's a catalog that I'll tell you about in a, a little bit later too, but there's a comment book that's included by the video. Is it on the bench there? And I'd really appreciate if you take a time to respond. It's sort of the archive of the piece as it shows in Corvallis and Eugene and California and Holland. Um, it sort of tells us what this community is thinking about the plates or the capital punishment or your response. So I hope you have a chance to um, write in that. And some of the comments, just the new ones, uh, this was actually a verbal comment, but um, somebody in Corvallis looked at all the plates and said, you, I really, I looked at these and I thought, that, that gal is really in a rut. <laughs> So that was a great comment. <laughs> and then, um, you know, other people say like, how can you maintain this project? How can you work on it so long? And I, I guess to talk about process for a second and just say, well, yeah, I suppose you could say I'm in a rut, but I'm also, it's actually an honor to have an idea that you wanna work on for a long time. You gotta go to the studio and know what I want to do half the year. And then the other half of the year I do other projects and I, I don't know what I want to do, but um, that's the way it works. Um, so right, now, yes, I was born in Japan in 1961, and here's the photo that proves it, um, on, my mom's, on my mom's lap. Uh, my family is mostly Midwestern, um, my dad was in the service, um, and fairly conservative, and uh, uh, had a Christian upbringing, and so um, a very loving family who really supported the arts and me. Um, and Japan and the Midwest have something in common, I realized when I was preparing for this talk, and that is a love of craft, a love of handmade. So my mom sews, well, she was a home ec teacher, I could sew before I could walk. Um, and then in Japan, you know, painting is fine and everybody can do that, and certainly the, the beautiful um, kanji, but a tea bowl is, really something special in Japan. Um, and so in my home we had beautiful ceramics, Japanese prints, quilts that my mother and family made, and handmade Rube Goldberg sort of things that my uncles made out of wood. So that's my, my art heritage really. And I think it, it is, informs why I work the way I work. So um, I wanted to show a little bit about process. I know um, I, at Oregon State, uh, work with the visiting artist program there, and I, I always love to see how people evolve and their work over time. So I'll do a little bit of a lead in to, to the Last Supper, which is the focus of the talk. Is my volume okay? If you can hear, Alyssa, you raise your hand wildly if I can't ever. 
she's my student, she will obey. Um, <laughs> so um, I moved back to Japan um, in, as an adult and ran a foreign language school. That was a great opportunity to be a foreigner and be a tall, at that time I had long, uh, big long blonde hair and cowboy boots walking around in rural Japan and kids would scream. So that's a great um, experience to be that other, you know, as a Midwesterner and a, a white woman in America, no problem, but a uh, different deal. So um, these works are all by me unless otherwise stated. We'll see a few other of my mentors coming up. Food and animals, personal narration. So these are small, this is an egg tempera about this size. And making work that was portable. I've lived in 13 states. I haven't lived in our home in Oregon for 13 years, so I'm settling down, but I'm just in that habit of making work that can be carried. Although now that we have 500 plates, it's questionable whether I can carry them, but <laughs> uh, one at a time. So I always think about scale and also um, documentation of work uh, that's large. If it is, I think about that archiving and practical issues, I guess. More egg tempera. This was painted while I was in, actually in Tibet before the last presidential election. Uh, the, uh, when, uh, which presidential election? 2008. Um, and I was worried about the election, but it worked out fine, uh, in my opinion. Um, another egg tempera called um, Don't Name Fish After Friends. So this, I got a pair of koi and named them after Roger Shimamura and Janet Davidson Hughes, my friends. And then my cat ate Janet. Um, it was an outdoor pond. So I had, I learned about things like that and I may now have a cover and so that's why it's called Don't Name Fish After Friends. So all the paintings have stories of my own work, um, but you don't usually know the stories unless I'm here telling them. That's fine with me if you just see a black cat and wonder what's wrong. Um, and that piece is actually, um, so I've I'm, I'm been painting an egg temper for a number of years and am known and there's not that many contemporary artists that work in egg tempera, so uh, Henry Sayer invited me, and I, I'm in the world of art, and there's a video that shows that process. That's on my website, too, uh, greenjulie.com, if you're interested in a contemporary application of egg tempera. Um, my husband, Clay Lohman, this is a, a quilt of his. He's a painter by training, we both are, and then we both sort of turn the dark side and are, are exploring crafts right now, What well, materials that are traditionally used as craft in this country. Um, and Clay is, let's see, my best friend, best critic, beloved. We've been together 24 years, and he's just a great inspiration, and s we work very closely together. So he, he's here tonight, but he steps out. I'm, he makes me nervous talking, and I make him nervous uh, public talking, you know. <laughs> but he's here, he's always present. And Roger Shimamura, some of you may be familiar with his work. He's a wonderful painter who's Northwest and Midwest and New York based, I guess. This piece is Shimamura crossing the Delaware. <laughs> it's in the uh, Smithsonian and um, the, or the National Gallery. Yeah, at, and he, um, Roger was chair of my thesis committee at the University of Kansas. It's one of the reasons I wanted to return to that program and study painting with Roger. And he's become one of my dear mentors and friends. And um, his work is social political, as you can tell. Uh, he was interned in Minidoki, Idaho as a, as a child. So his work is ab about some experiences of, of that and, and being a third generation Japanese in this country, uh, Japanese American in this country. And Roger asked me uh, maybe 14 years ago or so, have you ever worked in a series? He was just looking at my paintings. And I said, no. And it was like Pandora's box. It was some sort of demon seed he planted in me. Because then, like, all I've done for the last 14 years, it seems like, is series. Um, this is one uh, called Dead Dog Shrine. And when I was at the University of Oklahoma, that was my first tenure track teaching position. And um, they had a real problem with um, animal shelters. Uh, not, they were not no-kill shelters. And so in a Norman, Oklahoma, which is maybe 90,000 people, they were putting down 450 dogs a month. So this is a, a glycerin. Clay helped me make molds, and I made these dogs, and they're going into this burnt-out doghouse. And I just wanted to heighten public awareness of that in that town. Um, and so I think that in a way this is related 
to the Last Supper on several levels and that it's a piece with multiples that is to maybe uh, educate uh, about our system. Um, a piece called Wallpaper, which is 30 sheets of hand-painted seashells, so a much more meditative and quiet piece. And, oh, did you turn your phone off? I was gonna ask that earlier. Um, a series of, of smartphones. I was inter I'm interested in the screens people choose and, and the whole phone. phone. I, I hate phones, but I love my iPhone. I don't like talking on the phone, but I find such a great tool for, there's even a level I can level paintings, you know, what a, it's technology is so interesting. Um, and so the idea equals the material. Um, whenever I get ready to do a new project, I think about what techniques are available in painting or even other mediums and what would be the best materials to use for that idea. So it's very much um, idea first and then looking at the range of materials available. And most recently, these some of these are in the gift shop. I'm doing, after years of clay, saying, why don't you combine your narrative paintings, what we saw earlier, my narrative paintings, with the plates? And I'm like, because they're different, I can't. Um, and it's like five years he says this. And one day I was going into Paint and Egg Tempera and I, I knew what it looked like in my mind completely before I started. And, and so I didn't need to paint it. I didn't want to paint it because it's too familiar. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'm desperate. I'll try that idea. Um, and it was really, really wide open. I felt very um, excited to paint, to respond to these existing plates and to um, put idea equals material. So that is, you know, a U-Haul and ceramics. Nobody but me perhaps would see that that's a perfect fit. But um, it, it felt right. So, um, and then a, a, a non-organic gardener. This is called Roundup. And does anybody know who Mary Barnes is here? Josephine, do you? Do you know that name? Okay. Do you know? Well, okay, so I'll tell you. Sorry. Um, this is a, an, uh, well, it's actually a, a strange story. She is a woman who was um, institutionalized in England uh, for, for many years, and she lived in a, a group home, and she was completely, had to live alone. She had, it's, a, it's, it's, it's gross, but it's, it's a fact. She had a condition where she would smear, uh, she would defecate, and she would smear it on herself, and so she had to live a very isolated life but there's a happy ending. Somebody gave her paint, and she started painting, and it cured her, and she stopped doing that completely. And she became, you should look her up, she became quite a well-known British painter in the 70s. And I just think, it, my, my neighbor has a bumper sticker that says, Art Saves Lives. And I saw that, and I thought, oh, that's really a little much um, when I saw it. And then I thought, you know, it really, well, certainly for Mary Barnes, and perhaps Myself, um, I feel so lucky to have something that I, I love to do, that I am connected to, and that brings meaning to the day and a purpose in my life. So I, I think that um, it's worth noting her. Ronald Reagan and me, another story I won't tell you. <laughs> There's a story. So um, my studio year is f half and half, about half the year, mostly the summer months when I'm out in the garden. I'm painting those shell ink paintings or my egg tempera or my uh, lighter plates. Um, and then the other half of the year, the rainy winter months, um, I'm working on my Last Supper project. But I think that there is a thread. It isn't completely different and that all of it is an observation of contemporary society, whether it's more personal or a little more public. Um, the Last Supper, It's a project I began in Oklahoma in 1998 when I read The Final Meals in the newspaper. And I think that uh, in all of our lives, our creative acts are self-portraits and they're a reflection of our background and where we are now. And so in the fact that I was living in Oklahoma, it's the highest per capita in the United States, the highest per capita of, um, excuse me, capital convictions in the United States, higher than Texas. So it's a smaller population, but it, it's highest per capita. And um, 
So in the morning paper, they'd have these meals, and that's how I began the project. So definitely, I, I think if I would have went right from KU to Oregon, I wouldn't have begun this project. And uh, actually, Oklahoma was a hard place to live um, in many ways, so far from the ocean and other things, like organic food. I had to drive three miles to <laughs> get organic food. Uh, excuse me, three hours. Forget three miles. Um, three hours. I had to drive to Tulsa to get organic food. Um, so, you know, just, um, but at the time it wasn't, I had great colleagues, but it wasn't the easiest place I've ever lived. But it brought, from that time, this project came. So I'm really, I'm really grateful for my time in Oklahoma and um, that it led me to this project. A and so most of you have seen the, the exhibition, but I'll read you a few uh, menus of note just to give an overview. Um, or, uh, and not even of note, some are, are very um, ordinary, I guess. So. Uh, North Carolina, 30 January 1998, one honey bun. Georgia, 29 April 2009, steak, fried chicken breast, baked potato, salad, garlic bread, a pint of butter pecan ice cream, half a pecan pie, and soda. So this inmate requested to save half the pie to enjoy after his execution. He was brain damaged and didn't understand the implications. Um, Indiana, 14 March 2001, German ravioli and chicken dumplings prepared by his mother and prison dietary staff. Mississippi, uh, 23 July 1947, fried chicken and watermelon, two meals served on this date to boys age 15 and 16. Oregon, uh, 6 September 1996, Five fried eggs, sunny side up, hash browns, bacon strips, crisp, stack of pancakes with syrup, coffee, milk, and cold orange juice. Request closed with, I would appreciate the eggs served hot. And one more, Indiana, 05 uh, May 2007, pizza and birthday cake shared with 50, 15 family members and friends, a prison official said he told us he never had a birthday cake, so we made a birthday cake for him. That plate um, tells quite a story to me. I had lots of birthday cakes every year, and I bet most of us did as, as kids, so I think it speaks to the background of people who end up on death row, the family situation, the economic situation, the lack of s mm, stability in the homes of uh, many of these inmates. So final meals humanized death row for me. And then we can just flip through some others. I'm always surprised by vending machine requests. I haven't eaten out of a vending machine for a while. It's an interesting final meal choice. Um, last meals, this is a handwritten request. So on the left, it's written by the inmate. This is a Texas request. And on the right, it's substituted by the dietary staff. Because when Texas had a, um, I'll tell you a little more about Texas later. There's a lot we could talk about in Texas. But um, when they had their full, elaborate uh, final meal request, you could never have steak. It was always hamburger, which I think is interesting where there's so many cattle that you wouldn't have that option. Um, but in Texas, it, it has always been what's in the prison pantry. So that's a very modest pantry. You know, if I, I suppose if I were to cook in a, a meal in Texas, you know, maybe omelet and hash browns or something would be about as uh, elaborate as you could get in Texas. So I think when viewing that exhibition, one of the really common responses is, oh, these meals are so humble. You know, these meals are so modest. But um, you should bear in mind that the choices are also limited. Um, especially in the states with high numbers of executions. In the states like um, California, which has a very large death row population, um, but they actually have not had very many executions, you have a $50 restaurant limit. So that's um, generous, uh, I guess, in the system. And like Idaho and a few states like that, a few Western states have the biggest budget, and those are all states with low numbers of executions. 
This is the 500th plate uh, of Virginia request for seafood. So when I get ready to paint a plate, I s select a vending machine shaped plate or a fish shaped plate or the size of the meal. And this is a big platter and actually the request was simply seafood. But as a commemorative plate for myself, I guess, in this project, I allowed a platter and I allowed living fish just because I was so sick of painting fried fish. Um, and so I painted living fish um, for this menu. And Texas, um, this is a, the largest plate, not quite that large, but it's, um, it's, it's that big. And it's also the heaviest, maybe three pounds. And it's um, a big diner kind of uh, plate like you'd think of Woolworths in the 50s. Um, on the 21st of September, this uh, white supremacist was executed after ordering this huge meal and he didn't eat the meal. Did some people hear about this? And so Texas took that opportunity to comment, uh, to stop having the practice of final meals. So having, um, so now Texas does not allow inmates to choose their final meals. You're given the standard meal of the day, which almost all of the inmates in the last year and a half have declined. So there's no more final meals in Texas. So Texas accounts for a third of all the all the executions and all the final, well, we'll forget that now, right? Texas accounts for a third of all the executions in the United States, huge numbers. Um, and they used to be very open about it to the, well, like on their Department of Corrections website, they had the final meals and Texas was just known for that. They were known for their final meals, which is a weird thing to be known for, um, but they almost seemed proud of it. It was all right there and I always thought, Actually, it was bad PR. For if, you were, if, you, if, you, if I were in favor of capital punishment and living in Texas, I would have been more quiet about it. And so I think they finally figured that out. And that's my take is that they're being more quiet about their executions. Guess what state is behind Texas uh, as far as high numbers of executions? It's actually Virginia, which, have you, do you ever hear about that? No, because they've been really quiet about it. They have smarter PR people in Virginia, I think. Um, so they're very, um, they've had a lot of executions too. So now um, it's just uh, none in Texas. And uh, a book called Last Words by Robert Elder, Clay's a wonderful, um, he's my personal librarian too. Um, and so he brings home stacks of both nonfiction and um, picture books and everything related to capital punishment that I might be interested to. Um, and fashion books or whatever, you know, everything. Um, you'd have to have both. But um, this was a book called um, Last Words by Robert Elder and it lists um, last words going back from the beginning of records in the United States of, of final words. And in the description of those final words, he goes into last meals and often last, there's a relationship and last words back then and occasionally still are, about the foods. So I was able to, for the first time, get menus before, um, well, we've ha had capital punishment reinstated since 1976, but in fact, there aren't really records um, before about 1980, 1990, more clearly. So I will never be able to, there's been about 1,350 or uh, executions since 76 but I would never be able to paint all those because half of those records are gone. But um, this has been a chance. So this is a, like a 1917 apple, which was a, a delight to paint as compared to blue macaroni and cheese, which is my least favorite thing to paint. Um, so this is that first menu that I saw in the newspaper that um, was the start of the project. And it's dark and I don't think you can read the text, but I think it's worth noting a couple lines, which is, um, in the first paragraph, I won't read it all, but this is just in the city paper, the Norman transcript. It says, Johnson blinked three times and let out a breath through puffed cheeks. His foot stopped shaking, his eyes slowly dimmed, became glassy and closed to a crescent. So that's what I saw first thing in the morning. And then um, it closes with, he asked for a final meal of fried chicken thighs, 10 or 15 shrimp, pecan pie, strawberry ice cream, uh, honey and biscuits and a Coke. So I thought, what 
is that doing in the newspaper? And w I didn't. I was very um, shocked to see that in the newspaper. It's it's a hard way to wake up, but it, it was. Um, so I clipped it, and then I. This is Oklahoma, 19, wait, 1998. There were a lot of executions right then in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's like number five. They have, they've had a lot of executions. Hi, um, and so I just started saving these and thinking about those meals. So that's how the project began. And I actually, I was really pleased that you guys hung the initial drawing. I think that may even be that menu. So if you see the exhibition outside, uh, behind the video, there's that, um, thank you for hanging that, that first drawing. So when I thought about doing the project, I thought about, mm, well, I didn't think about spending 13 years on it, let me tell you. Um, I thought about ways to, I was an egg tempera painter, so I painted egg tempera. I did a few, and then I did embroidery on napkins. French fries take days, so that wasn't going to work. Um, and I just thought about what materials would work for this project. And when I moved to Oregon, um, I took a China painting class first thing and um, did one color plate, which is also hanging. And I realized if you can't get cadmium red um, mineral paints, this, so these are kiln fired, and you don't, so these are earth colors. You wouldn't want cadmium red. You wouldn't want to be inhaling that, and I wouldn't want to be painting with it um, in this medium. And so, it was like mauve, brick red, and that makes a really poor ketchup choice. Um, and so I thought, that won't work, it's gonna have to be one color, and that led me to the blue and white. Although George Carlin said there is no blue food, and um, it is a, it's a awkward color for food. It's like plants too in the garden, there's really very few pure blue natural things, aren't there? But um, I think that the, the tradition of blue and white ceramics in this country and every country um, is certainly uh, what I was thinking about. So this chart um, is probably a bit too small to read, but we can see Oregon has had um, two executions. There's Texas, Virginia, Oklahoma, right? That's one, two, and three as far as numbers. And then actually it's been encouraging um, in the years that I've been keeping track to watch that these 16 states without the death penalty and you're abolished. Um, those numbers have grown quite a bit. It was 11, I think, when I started. So, and I heard something happened with Maryland today. Uh, did you get, what was that? I just got a little, do, do you know? Well, anyway, Maryland's examining their uh, system too. And it's just so exciting, actually, to be in this state um, with Governor uh, Kitzhaber and his stance on capital punishment and showing this piece right now in Oregon and here it's, it's um, it's timely, so thank you for having me here now. I hope the governor, I, I keep, I have, uh, getting to, to, starting to bug the governor's office, but I would really like for him to see this. If anybody knows the governor, please invite him to see this show, because I think it would be um, uh, great for him to see it. Yeah, so the, down there below, uh, I, I hope that my intention for making the project is that it um, generates conversation and leads to a more informed stance. Um, one of the things that keeps me working on this project when there's lighter, more delightful things I could paint um, is the fact that I, I talk to educated people who aren't well informed on capital punishment and so I think we just as a country um, need to be aware and have a more educated stance. I mean, the fact that people think that um, we would save money by a capital conviction is, is incorrect because of litigation. It's such an expensive conviction. And um, so life without parole is, is a far less expensive option. And I'm certainly a believer that that's a good option in some cases, it's unfortunate, but I'm not thinking that we should you know not have a prison. It's not like that, but I think that we, um, and even the margin for error. So I, I mentioned that I was raised in this Christian and conservative family. My childhood diaries say, you know, win Nixon, go, go, you know. So you were a product of your families. My mom now actually is um, on my side of the fence politically and, or I'm on her side or we both changed, whatever. But as far as capital punishment, um, she no longer supports it because of this project. So I like to say, if you can change your mom, you can change the world. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, you know, they put that in the Norman, the, that came out in a report with, the, um, with this paper in Corvallis, and the um, reporter put it in, you know, lots, you have a conversation, a lot gets edited. And I sent that to my mom, and I thought, I wonder what she's gonna say. Well, she liked it, she actually liked it better than the New York Times article. And I think it's because she was mentioned. She liked being mentioned, so it's like, you never know what they're gonna do, those moms. It's like, I, I never know if, uh, which, what she's gonna say, if it's okay or not, but she, she's good. Um, so, um, when looking at the inmates' humble choices, as I mentioned, the, the, um, the traditions vary from state to state. Part of my research at Oregon State, I've been able to contact all the prisons and find out about these variations. So, over the years, I've learned a lot. Um, and so now Maryland and Texas both don't allow a meal selection. Um, a cigarette is permitted in some prisons. In fact, I think that it's usually snuck, even though it's on the books that it's not supposed to be allowed from what I've read. Um, and Sister Helen Prajing's writings will talk about guards and final meals. Uh, and it seems like um, cigarettes are usually snuck or provided. Alcohol is never provided. Um, oh, and it's worth noting too that um, I think we really do see clues about personality, race, and region. I mentioned that one um, birthday cake, but even region, and I would say even religion, one of the Oklahoma menus that was um, a meal that looked more tasty to me was like uh, chicken, olives, pomegranate, spelled wrong by the prison, but um, it, it was a, in, an, excuse me, a Middle Eastern man which is a certainly a minority in Oklahoma um, on death row. And so we can we get a sense of um, who these inmates are without looking at their names. Sometimes I'm asked why I don't include the names. I think it's that reading that first newspaper article and reading about someone being executed and their facial expressions and their name, I didn't need, well, I didn't need to know any of that in some ways, but I didn't, it wasn't, a, it's not about, I wanna point to the state I want to point to the state and the date of execution. I, I don't want to point to the inmate. That isn't where my interest is here. I mean, certainly there are terrible crimes that were committed in almost all cases. Um, and I guess it's the margin for error that led me to, margin for error in all judicial processes um, that led me to re-examine my stance at 21 on capital punishment. Until then, I was in favor of it. In early 20s, I started re-examining it. Um, so my narrative paintings are painted from memory, and I have a bad memory. Um, so I'm interested in how we process memory, what we choose to remember, what we choose to forget. Um, I, I haven't eaten uh, beef or pork since high school. I was probably the first vegetarian. My family had a meeting about like if that was okay or not to be a vegetarian in Iowa. In, uh, and they thought I was going to die um, if I didn't eat red meat. So I had no, I'm trying to paint like these steaks from memory, but I have no memory of steak. So Clay was a help, because he does. Oh, you came in. Um, there he is. Um, so he um, helps me with porterhouse and uh, steak identification. And he's my source. But after a while, I, th I thought, you know, if I'm gonna keep working on this project, I actually don't want, I don't catfish and salmon. I'm, I mean, I'm not really great on identification of many of those things. So now I use Joy of Cooking and these Safeway ads and Kentucky Fried Chicken ads that used to really bother me when they came in the junk mail. I look at them gleefully now when I cut and paste them and this is my recipe scrapbook. Uh, and I use my, my phone and do uh, Google Voice too for, you know, uh, mint chocolate chip ice cream Hagen dazs and there I get my image. So uh, whatever sources I do now always paint pretty much from photos except for chocolate cake and apples and things I know really well. Um, so Tony Acock and I are firing a plate here. She's a, an amazing woman who taught me the medium in 2000 when I uh, moved to Oregon. It was the first phone call I made when we hooked in the landline even before calling my mom and telling her we were here. I, I looked up China painting and and got Tony, and she's just been an amazing support. I couldn't do the project without her. She, um, I'm, f I'm applying the paint thickly with one fire. Uh, traditionally, mineral paint or china paint is done sort of thin coat and fired several times, but um, I'm doing more art brute like an oil painter that I am by training really, uh, and so it's just one time. And so this is that first color plate. Um, check on my. And um, there's that 
ketchup or tomato that won't work. And my outdoor studio and companions. <laughs> and um, a little bit of our background and why um, I'm interested in food and the final meals. And Clay made the most beautiful kitchen for me, and I cook a lot. Um, and I'm not the only person that um, has done final meals. So I made these, just started this project, and then over time, Cecilia Shapiro is probably um, a quite well known photographer on this project. And then there's, I probably have a name of 30 or so artists who have done something on final meals, a number of Canadians and Britain, Br uh, Brits too. Um, mostly photography. I think the, the New York Times reporter asked if I was the only painter, and I, I am as far as I know, but I'd be interested. I don't find it competitive. I'm, I'm always just interested in uh, how people take the same image or come across things and how artists, that's happened throughout history, that artists across town or across the world will be working independently on the same exact idea. That's, so this is the publication that Jill mentioned, then there's one copy in the um, bookstore, and um, actually David Huff is here, and he did um, such a great job writing a Ford Family Foundation, so we were able to sell that publication at cost. So it weighs four pounds, it's huge, it has every plate. And it's another way to look at the project, and it's been um, terrific to have that realized. And um, the Art Center, the plates just have come from there to here. and. Then these things, all Jill mentioned, thank you, and I wanted to just um, flip through, uh, yeah, and then this horrible thing coming up, the Cobeo Report. Um, I, was, I got that email from Comedy Central, so we don't have a TV, we, we don't even have a sofa. You know, we're just not that <laughs> type of people. And so I had talked to my students about the New York Times because I had to cut class one day to have the interview, so they knew what was going on. And, and I, I always like to make my learning experiences, you know, help students as well. And so I said, you know, well, when you talk to the reporter, answer the questions asked. That's the that's what I said. And then we're talking, about, and then I said, it seemed to go well, and I answered the questions asked. And I said, do you guys even read the New York Times? And they're like, well, you know, we know what it is. <laughs> and so I said, where do you get your news? And they said, um, the Daily Show and the Colbert Report. And I said, aren't those comedy shows? Like, yeah, yeah, but you know, we can figure it out. And so I go home, and like 12 hours later, I get this email, and I'd never, I'd heard of The Daily Show, I'd never heard of The Colbert Report. I get this email from The Colbert Report, which I now knew what it was, um, because my students had just told me. And, and they said, do you want to come on and do this show? And, and my first instinct, excuse my uh, language, but was hell no, like, what, what, who are these people? Like, Comedy Central, this is about capital punishment, and what, I was offended. And so I emailed Roger Shimamura and a couple students, and, and they're like, oh, you must do it. Uh, a couple former students and, and friends and things, and they're like, oh, you must, that's a whole other audience, and you should do it. And so I, I slept on it, and, and then I decided, you know, um, I always encourage people to push themselves and try new things, so who am I to only talk to the New York Times, but not the Colbert Report? Like how, that's elitist, you know? And it's also, it's not hitting the audience, um, a new audience, and so, uh, April 11th is the date, and so um, we'll see how that goes. Clay and I were going to uh, fly to New York and bring 10 plates, and um, that's, that's happening. And so, um, and there's actually, um, these, the Whole Foods has been an amazing uh, support of this project, and if you go to my website, um, I think it's linked, well anyway, there's a, if you, there's a video, um, the Last Supper, if you go to Dark Rye, it's a, it's a site that they do. It's a social, uh, political, on food. Well, lots of angles on food. And this is the crew, and they came and, and, and filmed. But all this attention, you know, I'm a person who loves living in rural places um, and quiet places. Corvallis is a good size for me. You know, I lived in a farmhouse next to a rice field in Japan. I was very comfortable with that. So. That I, this is a, um, uncomfortable for me to uh, be this kind of press exposure. I mean, I'm very honored, but it's been um, foreign. But I had a, um, once I was giving a talk at a museum, we were doing a test run, and the, I was nervous just with the curator, Deborah Gangwer, and she said, it's not about you, honor the work. And I thought, well, that's true. 
And so through all this um, 15 minutes of fame that I'm at the end of, I hope, um, I have just realized um, it's, it's not about me and just honor the work. I'm just talking about the work, so it's no, it's no problem. So I, I, I think that's helpful for public speaking to um, remember that, and that's why I'm saying it now. <laughs> um, and I have a fellowship at the, I just wanted to give you a little uh, overview of what's happening from here. I have, I'm good to do some writing and some, some painting and some quietness after I turn in grades in two weeks. So spring term, I have release time. Oregon State's been a really wonderful uh, support of, of my research. And every time the show is hung, it's a really different installation. So this is at the Art Center um, and how it is formed. And then paper plates were in Holland and I'm taking them to Texas, um, 160 paper plates to, which is a good place to take them, to a, it's American Criminal Justice Society. It's a bunch of attorneys and uh, law professors to give a lecture um, in two weeks. And then we'll have a show of the plates there that's a big truck coming to pick up the Last Supper. And I, I wanted to mention, um, this was last year at the University of Nebraska, uh, an English class actually performed the Exonerated in the space in the Texas room uh, at the Last Supper. And I'd be pleased to assist if there's U, U of O faculty or students that would like to do something with the project, just let me know how I could help. Because I think it's, a, it's so interdisciplinary that it, it crosses into lots of different areas. And another, this was at the University of Kansas, my friend Ed hung very straight rows. Um, so different every time. And then my, um, I'm looking for a permanent home to donate or loan the project. This is a photograph in the basement with the bins. It's quite a, a big collection when it's not being shown. So um, making um, and making art as meditation, some of the things I think of I've mentioned, but I think of the victims, the crimes, the families, the margin for error. And I think about why this ritual. That's when I first began the project, I wondered why we have this ritual. And so here it is 13 years later, and I still wonder why we have this ritual. I, I know more about the ritual, but I, I don't have uh, an answer. I, I love this quote by Andy Warhol, the artist of the future will just point, and I paint to point. So thank you for listening. And if, if there's a few questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yes, please. So what keeps you doing this? Right. You said 13, you said 13 years. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Tell me what, what's propelling you. You, actually you. I was going to be funny and say I'm in a rut, but I won't. Um, but actually you, because there's, there's interest in it. Um, we were driving over and I said to Clay, you know, it's... Uh, Artists aren't known for public speaking. Uh, performance artists are, Beverly is, but not myself. Um, but there's, there's interest. There's, so I feel obligated. That's one, th I mean, that's the first one. I feel service, like public service. It feels like volunteerism, I, that's one level. That's the public answer. But on a personal level, I've always been a supporter of the underdog. Like I look around and go, like we'd have contests with my brother, and he wanted to use the most salt, and I'd use so I'd take pepper. You know, all my life I sort of look around and go, like, what's not equal? And so I think it's uh, an interest in justice. Yeah. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, Beverly. Yeah, yeah, the process is, um, right now I'm just starting again. Um, it's my winter, I'm late because of the, the um, busyness. Um, I just, in the morning I um, get online and look and see if there was an execution. Uh, so in the morning I'll wake up and look and see if there was an execution today. And then I find out that inmate's name and I go to, and then I, Google final, his final meal, usually his, like 99.9%, .9%, and then um, I'll paint that plate. So I do the most current, so for 2013, I'll do this whole year, and, and happily, I can do all this year. It used to be more than I could do in a year, but executions are down so many. 
um, there's about 30 or 40 a year instead of twice or more than twice that. Um, and then I have time to go back and do historical menus um, earlier. And I'm going way back because that's just fills the, it's, I find it historically interesting. So, you know, 1917, 1947, like those two boys. And, uh, you know, and why do I keep doing this piece? Like when I saw that plate, uh, that from last words, I learned about that 1947 pair of 15 and 16 year old black boys um, executed by a traveling electric carrier. That doesn't happen now. That, that exact thing doesn't happen right now. We don't execute 15 and 16 year old boys. Um, so that's, we're making progress, so that's encouraging. Yeah, but that's the process. And I, so I, I try to keep my numbers about the same as the overall numbers. So a third of my plates are Texas and a third of all the executions are Texas. But like in Oregon, I painted both because there's only two and because I live here and I felt I should. Um, so it's, 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 there's an order, but it's um, somewhat logical and somewhat Julie's order of agenda. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just putting that out there. I don't, I, I would like it to be a, um, it could be Oregon, it could be Texas. Uh, I would like it in the United States. And it, Where does it look like? Yeah, it has to be a beautiful, a beautiful space with bright lights and public access and parking and free and room to grow by 50 plates a year until we no longer have capital punishment. So it's a tall order. But I, I think you just start putting it out there. I just realized I've been thinking about that for a couple of years, and Clay's like, well, why don't you mention it? And I'm like, yeah, that's it. I'm going to tell people. That's how we'll find it. Because like, I wanted to show the plates in Texas, and I, I just mentioned it to a couple of friends. And I have uh, this one friend, Cheryl's from Texas, and she just hounded this woman at Diverse Works in Houston until I got a show. I mean, I thought she was going like, to get in trouble. She was bothering this woman so much. And then, lo and behold, it happened. So I think that's you know, word of mouth. So I'm just putting it out there. Not much. Um, n I've never displayed in a church, although there's been several Unitarian churches that were interested, um, but they've never. Um, I do ask that the venues provide transportation and hang it, and, and even just that installation, a lot of maybe church, Jill knew how to have that happen. But, you know, you have to have support, and of course she asked Charlie. And um, so I would like to see that happen. And, uh, you know, I'd actually like to see it at prisons and libraries. That's why I made the paper plates, too, to make a, a mobile, inexpensive way to do that. I'm so I, I make, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Whenever I show the plates, I, I, I pretty much always go and um, give a public talk. So you could give public talks on the lighter side without taking all this stuff. Yeah, it's true. But you know, I'm, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gotcha. I, um, I'm happy to do it from time to time with the right thing. But m mostly, it takes a long time to paint. So I just, it, and leaving the house and the cat and the husband, and it, that's not, I'm not like a, that's not me very much. But for the right place, I certainly would. Yeah, good question. I got you now. Yes, please. Uh, do you uh, ever exhibit something in prison? Or do prisoners are aware of the existence of the prison? Because it's something that I would like to show in a prison, that a prison, a school, and a public library are my three dream lists to um, so I've not shown in a prison, but every time a uh, press happens now, I usually get at least one letter from the prison, um, not usually death row. I think that it's hard even to have mail in and out from death row from my um, friends who are in capital or hell, so... Um, Julie, you need to go back to the microphone. Oh, yeah, there was a reason. Thank you. Right. The microphone. Um, so I haven't shown in a prison, I would like to, and I hear from inmates regularly, but not death row. And I, at early on in the project, I um, thought about trying to get access, and I had a friend who was doing 
work on social justice in prisons, and he was driving around. Actually, Eugene, Eugene-based writer, whose name I'm forgetting, somebody may know. Um, and he was driving to like, um, and thank you, I see your question in the end, I'll come right to it, thank you, in the back. Um, he, he'd drive to like Indiana, and he had an interview he'd lined up for months, and he'd get there and they'd say, we changed our mind, you can't come in. And I thought, well, I don't have time for that. I don't even drive, so I mean, on the highway, so that's just not gonna happen. I actually am, um, one of the things that came out in an interview at Bad at Sports, which is a great, that's a, isn't that a great uh, web, it's an art web, it's called Bad at Sports. I mentioned to the artist about, um, I mean, to the writer, I'm actually monovision, so, because she was talking about the depth being really kooky in my plates, and, and at, at, to, my painters, to my painting students, I talk about, um, our job as painters is to translate 3D space into 2D surface. Well, I'm actually Julie 2D. I have no three-dimensional uh, depth perception, so that gives the plates a quirkiness, and it also keeps me from wanting to drive to Indiana to talk to an inmate. <laughs> yeah, so there was a question in the back. Yes, please. Um, me, um, <clears throat> it's potentially a two-part question. Essentially, you, you've addressed uh, more on the social justice issue the margin of error that accompanies capital punishment. And I know myself, there are groups like the Innocence Project. Mm -hmm. I've read uh, studies that have shown people who have been convicted uh, capital punishment since and then uh, acquitted afterward, and some of whom were posthumously acquitted because they, they were executed before they were demonstrated to be innocent. Uh, I wonder if any of your work includes the last meals of people who were posthumously acquitted, and if it does, the second part is, did you find this out after you did the work or before? So I'd like you to find out those people, and I can answer. I, you know, I don't. I don't read a lot of when I when I go get the when I get the um, executed. I just get the information. I will glance at the crime, but I, I can't read it carefully because it's many pages and nightmare material. And I, you, you know, when you have a long-term project, the way to keep going on it, I find, is you keep your eye on the task and you don't go over there. Um, and so. That's an interesting, I'm going tomorrow, two exonerated individuals are coming to Oregon State and I will get to hear them. It's the first time that I've had that opportunity. And my uh, interest is, I would love to have a conversation with them and uh, hopefully perhaps we'll get to and ask what their thoughts are on final meals from the inside, you know, what they, what they think of the process and why we have it. And then I'd like to ask them what the first meal they had is when they were released. And I would like to do a color plate for that, and that would be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you know, I have been in contact. People have contacted me actually and seen the project, and then, and then they sort of. Um, one person was going to work with her uh, group of released. Um, exonerated individuals in Philadelphia. That's on my to-do list when I'm at the center to write back and say what happened with that because she had, I had some questions she was gonna ask. And I'm also very interested in, um, I have a contact at Yeshiva University and they're connected to the Innocence Project and they're dear to my heart and I would like to, I think that would be a great place for the plates to show. And um, the, because the New York Times brought a, a good national um, conversation and interest in showing the plates in the Midwest and Pennsylvania, and I think that they'll probably do some kind of tour out that way. So I think there's good opportunities for more conversation. Maybe one more question? Yeah. Does that sound good, Jill? Yes, please.
So, so can you tell me his name again? Okay, I'll, I'll, thank you, thank you. That's a great, thank you, I learned something. Thank you, I will contact him. So thank you very much for coming and for your questions. Thank you, Joe.